Oh, goodness gracious. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have with us today um, Reverend Dr. Leanne Hadley, and um, Leanne has worked with our conference um, through the Center for Leadership Development for five years now, um, but has worked with children uh, for much longer. So we are really excited. Um, and she's invited Melinda Shunk, who's at Ar in Arkansas, and they'll introduce themselves um, more later. Um, but to come and share with us uh, some best practices for pastoral care um, with children, youth, and families. Um, and as they reminded me, it um, can go beyond just children and youth um, up to our adults and seniors and everything. Um, so we will be recording this and we'll put that out on our website and on our Facebook pages. So feel free to pass this on to um, staff, pastors, um, anyone you think that that would be, that would uh, benefit from uh, these years of wisdom and uh, pastoral care practices. So we are really excited and I will pass this over to Leanne and Melinda. Okay. Hey, I'm so glad that you all are here. My name is Leanne Hadley and I'm an elder in the United Methodist Church. And um, I started out in ministry working with children and here I am 35 years later still working with children. Um, and so I am currently serving at Christ Church United Methodist in Louisville, Kentucky. And I also um, do a consulting kind of program called A Time for Children. Um, where I do workshops and um, lectures, and I've worked so much with the North Texas Conference um, on, on that. So that's what I am. I'm also an author, um, and I have two books that um, I thought I'd plug, Blessed to be a Blessing, um, which is Sacred Circle Time with Kids, and then I also have a book called Touching Heaven, um, which I wrote a few years ago, um, but it's about children and their experiences with God as they die, and so those are my the selling books that I've done. Um, but I'm delighted to be with you and I believe strongly um, in what we're doing today and the need for pastoral care in addition to programming during this time of crisis. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Melinda to introduce herself. I, Melinda is my new friend. I think she is the bomb. I love her so much and I'm glad that she's here. So Melinda, introduce yourself. Well, thank you, Leanne. Um, my name is Melinda Shunk, and I am relatively new to Arkansas. This is our fourth year living here, and I was a classroom teacher for seven years, for 12 years in children's ministry. Um, took a couple years off. We have four kids, and now I am coordinator for the Arkansas Conference. So I work with, develop, train, advocate for all children's ministers here in the state. And so Leanne and I met each other when I hired her to come to our Beyond Conference, which you all are welcome to come to um, each Jan uh, January, we have that, but she was our guest speaker. And so that's where um, I had her come and train and and then things just took off from there so last week i did this same training um, for our conference as well in a webinar yeah so i was so impressed i just asked her to jump on um today so um if we can have our slides now we're going to start with just a moment of worship and melinda's going to read the scripture and then i'll just say a few words about it and Liam, before we start, if you have any questions as the presentation is going on, um, if y'all will just submit them in that chat box, um, just as they come up, and we'll have time at the end to answer those questions. So no need to hold it in your head, just throw it on the chat and we'll keep up with it. All right, go ahead. Here's the slide. There we go. There we go. All right, so we need the next one that has the scripture. I chose this verse because I just felt that we are creating a temple, a virtual temple. So our focus verse for today is, in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. I cried out to my God. God heard my voice from his temple. My cry for help reached his ears. 2 Samuel 22, 7. I think that... Um there is a theology out there, which is flawed, um, which says that uh, we only cry out to God with joy. And I think that um, lamenting and crying and going to God with our, 
our authentic selves as something, a new narrative that we need to reclaim. It was certainly part of the exile. It's certainly part of our lives today. And it breaks my heart when people say, I want to, to complain, but of course I can't complain to God. God will get angry to me. And so I love this because it reminds us that it is in our times of distress that we can cry out and that God wants to hear us no matter what. So this uh, scripture works great for the children that we're going to work with. They need to cry out. They need to have a place where they can speak to God. And that's what we're going to try to do is create this sacred space using these stones with children. But I also think that we need a place to cry out um, because we are distressed. And not only are we distressed, but we're carrying the distress of everybody on our shoulders. And so I just wanted, I love the scripture. I think it reminds us that it's okay to cry out to God when we're uncertain. Um, so I want to talk a little bit in the next slide about why we need holy listening. And um, so let me just tell you, I think holy listening, to, if I had to give it a definition, it would be that it's holding sacred space for God to do God's work. So we are not the people who fix the children. We're not the people who, um, who have to have special gift to do this other than we have to have the faith in God that if we gather with another person where two people are gathered, there I will be so that God can do God's work. And, um, I particularly think that we need holy listening right now. Um, as soon as this pandemic broke out, I was aware that, um, that our children are gonna be deeply impacted by this. At first, it seemed like children wouldn't because they're not gonna catch it. And if they do, they're probably not gonna have complications from it unless they are you know, already immune suppressed or something like that. For the bulk of our children, they're gonna watch this happening around them. Um, but when you think of the group that is going to be affected, um, it's going to be their grandparents. So we are going to have children in our congregations who lose their teachers, their grandparents, their loved ones. And there is a statistic, um, two statistics that I want to point out. One is that with just regular life, no pandemic, 20% um, of all children, so one in five, will lose a significant loved one before the age of 12. So that's if we, if we didn't have a pandemic going on. We had this pandemic, which is going to affect our older population, and that statistic is going to skyrocket. And the second statistic is that every time uh, somebody dies who, and a child is affected, 30 other children will be aware of that death and affected by it. So if in our church, one of our children loses their grandparent, there will be at least 30 other children who know that child, who go to school with that child. It could be 60, it could be 100 kids. And what we want to make sure is that that child gets holy listening, but the others do too, because they're going to be wondering, is it my grandmother next? How is my friend? How do I feel? They're going to be processing grief too. So this is going to get, the numbers are going to get huge quickly, and it's going to be important for us to be ready. Now, that's just my opinion, but um, Melinda has done some research for us. So, Melinda, share what the big dogs have said. Okay, well, this, uh, these articles are very current um, and from 2020, but it also just shows how Leanne um, is following the spirit and knowing and looking ahead and knowing what is working. And these um, articles share that. So the first talks about children being resilient. You've heard that on the news. You've heard that, oh, kids are resilient, kids are resilient. And I, my, my skin started to crawl um, when I heard that because I thought to myself, my goodness, if kids are so resilient, then why do people have childhood trauma? Why do people complain that this happened in my childhood and I didn't deal with it and now I have this as an adult? So um, I think resilient is being misused. Resilient is true. Children are resilient when given the tools to talk through and deal with the feelings, the fears, the trauma that they've experienced, then they are very resilient. And so here are two studies, and I'm just, not that you can't read, but some of you might be on a small iPad or a phone, and so I'll just read it out loud. It says, Father Gill said, the actual dynamics of how kids absorb this pandemic will follow patterns observed during and after Katrina. According to the 2017 study, kids experience the general atmosphere Fear of anxiety and panic as acutely as adults do, only they might be better at hiding it. <laughs> they actually might not even know they're having it. That fact might contribute to a general sense among adults that children are somehow naturally resilient and can bounce back easily. And that attitude from adults can hamper both proactive attempts to help children process 
what's happening and necessary therapeutic efforts after the disaster. So this was written by Van Newkirk um, to an Atlantic staff writer for 2020. But then the next stat, the next article I found uh, as great evidence and very helpful is from, oh, I'm not able to, hold on, is from Scott Berenito, senior editor of the Harvard Business Review for 2020. And he says, when you name it and you feel it and it moves through you, emotions need motion. So there's a physical activity that goes with emotions. Do you see how Leanne had this all figured out before this article was written? It is important we acknowledge what we go through. Your work is to feel your sadness and fear and anger, whether or not someone else is feeling something. Fighting it doesn't help because your body's producing the feeling. If we allow the feelings to happen, they'll happen in an orderly way and it empowers us. Then we're not the victims. So this is, if you need concrete evidence, this tells us right here why we need listening being, to become holy listeners and why holy listening stones will work. And you'll see that as we go through the process if this is new for you. Great. Okay. Um, so we want to talk just a second about the stages of grief. So these are, you know, if you've ever done much workshops on grief or whatever, you know that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is the one who really coined the five stages of grief, and we're familiar with those. Um, what I love about this illustration of them is that um, a lot of people think that they are linear, so that our goal is to get somebody to a place of acceptance. And I think for many of us who have been through grief, we feel like we need to reach that place of acceptance too. I heard Elizabeth Kubler-Ross speak, it's been a lot of years ago and now she has died, but at, her, um, at the thing that I heard her speak at, she said, you know, I love my stages of grief. I believe that they are accurate. After all these years of using them, I still believe that there are five stages of grief and that they are accurate and that they're helpful. Um, and she said, and it, you know, it made me a rich woman and I was able to do all this help, work all these people. But um, what I don't like is that it has set sort of this goal for people where they feel like unless they're in acceptance, they're doing it wrong. And she said, I just wish everybody would understand that these are just feelings that we have. So it's more like popcorn popping. You're going to feel bargaining in one minute, anger at another, acceptance at another. And in holy listening, we're not doing anything to move children towards anything. We are holding space for whatever they're feeling. So some of our children will be in bargaining. Some of them will be in anger. Some of them will be in sadness. And it is not our job to move them into a place of acceptance or understanding or anything. We hold the sacred space. And I think that is critical to understand the difference between holy listening and maybe therapy, which might work to help kids get into a place of acceptance. That's not what we're about, and it's certainly not what we're about during the time of a crisis. Um, in addition to this, there was another stage added, and I'll have Melinda explain that stage. Yes. So David Kessler um, studied with Elizabeth and was a good friends. After she passed, um, he himself had lost his 21 year old son. And he said, oh my goodness, I've been working with grief and counseling people and now I'm actually having all of these feelings and understanding this to a level that I never could have helped with anybody else. And when he'd gone through and felt his stages, he also found he was feeling a sense of meaning. That not meaning like his son died for a reason, but some kind of meaning came out of some good, just that God redeems to something good coming out of something bad. And so um, a couple years ago, he met with the Kubler-Ross family and requested that um, he ask that if meaning, if you see that down in the little blue, could be added to the five stages of grief. And they um, concurred and let him add meaning. So now there are currently six stages of grief. Okay, great. 
Okay, so we've talked a lot about the, you know, why, the why, the why. Now we're going to get down to business because it is my goal that by the time we get off of this webinar that you go out, you find yourself some rocks, you make some symbols on them, and you start doing holy listening. You will be proficient, it is, I am certain, by the end of this webinar. So um, this is um, my grandson, Griffin, and I thought before we go any further, we'll just show you kind of what it looks like to do holy listening with an actual child. So um, this is Griffin several years ago, but but, um, oh, I just love him. Okay, you can watch and see how holy listening stones work. Oh, are we not getting sound on that? I don't have the sound. Is anybody? Hello, I'm Leanne Hadley, and I am here with my grandson, Griffin. Griffin, tell them how old you are. Four. He's four years old, and um, Griffin has never done Holy Listening Stones before. I don't always use Holy Listening Stones with four-year-olds, so we're going to try it and see what Griffin does with them. Um, so, Griffin, these are Holy Listening Stones. They are stones that help you put your feelings into words and to tell God how you're feeling today, okay? So, um, I want you to look at these stones, and then I want you to pick, like, three of them and tell us how you're feeling today, okay? See what you find. Okay, how are you feeling? What did you choose? I choose um, trying, Talk real loud. trying to get these on the tree yeah. and then having a broken heart. Why do you have a broken heart? Because my friend doesn't want to play with me. Your friend doesn't want to play with you and that breaks your heart? I didn't know you had a broken heart. Okay, and what's the circle? The circle is... That someone's riding a race car in the house. Oh, okay. So somebody, so this one, he was going to put leaves on the tree. This is a race car, racetrack. He loves cars, don't you? Mm -hmm. But this one was interesting because he said that his friend broke his heart because his friend doesn't want to play with him and that breaks his heart. So he told us something very important about himself. He's only four and yet he found one of the stones at least that spoke to him. So Griffin, if you were going to do a prayer to God, what would your prayer be? What do you want from God? What, what what do you want to tell God or what do you need from God? What what do you want to say to God today? Okay, what did you want to tell God? I want to tell God died on the cross and I was standing. There's two water gonna make go to Jesus and make you wake up. Okay, so he said that Jesus died on the cross and that made him very, very sad. And now there's two waters and that water goes somewhere and it's gonna take him to Jesus and make him feel happy again. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let me show you one other tool. Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. What? What? Start all over. <laughs> okay, you want to start all over? Okay. What do you want to do? Well, is that a happy thing? I don't know. What do you think? I want to be happy. Okay, so that's a happy face. It was just a sad face. Uh huh. And, uh, Okay, tell us what that means. Um, that means when you're sad, you see um, a starfish, and then, and then if you're sad, you want to make, help you to make a tower, then that makes you happy. Very nice. 
okay. So you see how they work? They're the language of children. And so whether I understand exactly what he's saying or he just plays with them or whatever, he's becoming familiar with them. And then when he needs them, he can use them. So Griffin, thank you so much for helping us. I wanna show my friends one more thing, okay? Let's scoot those out of the way. These are the ones that I usually use with somebody Griffin's age, and they look just like the Holy Listening Stones, except instead of just having random things on them, they're different faces. Like this is a squinchy, sad face. This is a little bit happy. This is a little bit happy. This is like, oh, surprised. This one is, oh, this is very happy. This is very sad. And look at this one, he's crying. So Griffin, out of all of these faces, I want you to tell me, how are you today? How are you right now? Good. Can you show me on a face? Oh, he's very happy. Okay. And what about um, when you think about school? Do you like school? How does school make you feel? How do you feel about school? What's that face mean? Uh, sad. Yeah. Sad? Why don't you like school? Do you like school? No, no. What makes you sad at school? Oh, he's happy at school. Okay. All right. All right. Great, Griffin. Thank you. So these are holy listing stones, and um, you can see that even a four-year-old can use them. He's off and running. So even a four-year-old can use them, but usually I use them with kindergarten through sixth grade. But I wanted to show you the power of the symbolic language of children. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you'll make some holy listing stones and use them. They are a great tool for you to use with children. So make yourself a set, use them, and just see what happens. I think Think you will be delightfully surprised thank you god bless you all right yay griff did a great job um so i wanted you to see how simple it is it's not going to be like this holy experience it's going to be a kid sitting down with you you're holding sacred space they're going to say something about how they're feeling and then they're going to ask god for what they need and the stones the genius in the stones is simply that they speak the language of children. Children do not have words for what they're feeling. There's too many feelings jumbled up inside of them. Actually, none of us do when we're in crisis. Um, and so the stones just are like that tipping point that help children put their feelings into words. So I just want to show you real quick how it works. Um, that, that what, we, what I did with Britain, or with Griffin, sorry, I always call him my son's name. What I said, what I did with Griffin has a, a process to it. And it's simply this. You find a sacred space, so you make space. And a lot of times I lay out a little cloth and I light a little candle to make it like, this is special space. And then um, you prepare your stones, you just lay them out, and that just gets the kids interested. There's something about the symbols that kids like, and so you don't have to say, now we're going to do holy listening, sit down, do it You just say, I got some rocks, you want to look at them? And I have yet to find a kid who's not kind of like, I'll look at them, even teenagers, even adults are like, what are those? So you lay your stones out and then you ask them to choose two or three to show you, you know, how they're feeling. They choose them. You simply say, tell me more. They tell you. And then you say, pick another stone and uh, show me what your prayer is. They do. Or maybe you say a prayer and then you bless the child. And that's as simple as it is. So the most complicated part about this is getting yourself something, a piece of paper, some rocks, some um, little glass blobs, whatever it is to make your stones. Once you get your stones, all you have to do is hold sacred space and let that child share something. The beauty of it is it's short. It doesn't take forever. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But if you, if you trust the process, we have found that this is the most effective way um, to get children to speak about their deep and um, important feelings. All right, so. Um, yeah. can you, since the symbols are up here, and if somebody in this group has never done Holy Listening Stones before, um, a question that came up on the webinar last week was, what do those symbols mean? What do they mean? People wanted to place a meaning on one of those images. What would you say when someone says, well, what do they mean? I need to know a meaning for those pictures. That is a great question. In fact, when I first developed Holy Listening Stones, I just, I made a game. They were a game. And so I would have the heart and then it would be like, when are you feeling loved? And the little squunchy face, you know, was like, when are you confused? And the little shut eyes, when do you feel sad? Whatever. And then, um, 
children started coming to my center. I had a spirituality center at the time. Children started coming and we were playing with the rocks and they would say, that's not a, those eyes aren't shut. Those eyes are open. That's how I feel when it's my birthday party. Or um, that isn't um, a road that leads to happiness. That's flushing down the toilet. So they don't really have any meaning. That's the beauty of them. Children will see in those rocks whatever they need to tell you. The rocks just help them start to put it into words. And it also breaks this tension. So if you're a child and you come to me and I say, I know that you're upset about COVID-19. I want you to tell me how you're feeling. The kid just automatically withdraws the same way as any kid would when they feel pushed. And then you say, you know, tell me, tell me, the kid pulls away, pulls away. And then you're in this battle between everybody saying, um, oh gee, my phone's ringing. Um, and then the kids, you know, they push away from you, push away from you, push away from you. And um, with the stones, they break the tension between you. You simply say, look, there's a stone pick one. And so they're not feeling pushed to talk. They want to talk. It gives them a language. So it's a kind and a gentle way to get children to talk. So thanks for that question. There's no right or wrong to the questions, to the, to the stones. They're all whatever you see in the stones. All right. So I, I told you how to do the stones and then Melinda's going to share some ways that we use them in churches. And then we're going to get to the video part of how do you do this in, during COVID-19. So tell us some ideas about how these have been used in churches, Melinda. Well, um, this are two, this, uh, the one to the left, when you see the little animal creatures around it on wooden, those are wooden craft circles that someone has taken um, a black Sharpie and just drew Leanne's symbols on top of the little um, wood chips. And she has that setting. In fact, that is from, and note if there's any youth directors here, Hendricks College um, uh, Foundation for Call. She is a deaconess and she uses this with her college students um, when they come in, in order to house college going fine. Why don't you grab a couple stones and tell me why you grabbed what you grabbed is how she gets those college students to open up. So the one that looks the most childish is at a college campus, which I think is a fun uh, way for you all to start looking at that. She also went to Dollar Tree and found the little turtle and the lion and the dinosaur and the, um, to add to, um, a talking points because if somebody wasn't seen in a symbol, something she would say, well, which animal, which, which uh, cartoon image are you feeling today? And so sometimes people would pick a turtle up and they would say, slow as a turtle, I'm slow. Or they might um, pick up the cupcake and have, say, I'm having a sweet day, it's just so sweet. And so everybody had different reasons. Um, and it, it's, again, they mean nothing. They're a tool to get conversation starting. The one to the bottom by the little zippers, those are actual stones that were taken out of a pebble yard and the children's minister just took a black sharpie and she drew the symbols on that and she has that center she has a prayer center um, a room set up with prayer stations all around it and um weekly she has someone who's been trained as a holy listener and they wear a holy listener sticker and the child goes and grabs the person that has the holy listener sticker on and says, come here, we need to do holy listening. And the child and the adult go and they sit at that table and they do their holy listening stones. And that is just done in a weekly when we do not have a pandemic going on and we get to touch people and be around them. This is how they're used um, in a ministry setting um, easily and low functioning and as long as you have a trained holy listener it works um, you'll see a little writing up there that i said never do this behind closed doors um, leanne's church does it in a hallway uh, this um, obviously they're adults at the college but at the um, church where they do it it's a big open space room where lots of people are doing different prayer stations all around so those are some um, safe sanctuary things you want to keep in mind if when you're doing that you want to have a private conversation but just like when we're in a party or a large situation when two people are gathered in a public space you can have a speak quietly with one another and have a very caring and sharing sacred space without being pulling someone 
in an isolated situation. So just so that measure is out there. And we're going to talk about that when we get on the phone with somebody and how that looks when we're on the phone as well. So. Yeah, so it's my goal that in these churches that every church would do holy listening on a regular basis. But whether you've got that going in your church or not, that's why we're doing this webinar, it is time for us to take off our programming hats and put on our pastoral care hats. Yes. Um, children need the pastoral care as much as they need their Bible stories and everything else. So um, we've now played with this uh, for the last few weeks, and we are prepared to show you kind of what does it look like to do this um, through video. You saw it in person. What does it look like on video? So Melinda, I'll let you explain this because you're the one that met with this child. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, um, I have an iPhone. So I immediately was like, oh yeah, I can totally do this. I can FaceTime with my people. And then it dawned on me, my husband has a droid. Oh, 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 not everybody. You cannot connect with everyone. You could do this over a Zoom. It's, a, it's, a, you could, it's totally doable over a Zoom. But it's a little more intimate-ish, and you'll see when, I, when you see the video, if you're doing it um, phone to phone. So you would want to be prepared before going into um, uh, a virtual uh, time by downloading. They have Skype for iPhone. Um, and I've used that. They have Google Duo, which is very nice. And the recording that you're going to watch quickly here um, is done with um, Google Duo. And then just talk video, um, chat, and messenger. And I've not used that. But those are, would be the three. You probably want to have those apps on. The other thing before chatting with someone 18 years and younger yeah. is you would want to reach out to the parents. So the, before the, um, I did this video that you're going to watch, I called the mom and I said, hey, Mandy, I would love to do holy listening stones with your child. And she's like, what are you, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, well, she knows what this is because um, we've done this. We do this at the end of our time together when she's in class with me on um, Sundays and Wednesdays. And I would really love to be able to record this for training purposes. And her mom was like, well, tell me more. So here's a mom whose child had been doing it and she didn't know she was doing it. So you're gonna need to take some time to talk through the parents with the parents. And that's when you're gonna explain. I'm gonna have show some symbols on the screen and they're gonna pick two to three of those. And then they're going to tell me why um, they chose those. And I'm gonna listen to them and then we're going to um, pray about it. And that's all it is. And the mom was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just can totally do that. That works for me. And, it, and I said, and I would love it if you stayed in the room, if you felt comfortable, it'd be really nice. So see, again, I'm setting up a safe sanctuary situation that I invited the mom to be present during that time. So, or the parent. Now, if the parent's like, oh, no, I, I think they'll talk better if it's just the two of you. So if their response is that to you, you would then say, that sounds great. Can you put me, can you put us in a living room or a shared space that you might be in and out of so that if, if there's questions or anything that you're in earshot? And so that, again, keeps you as a um, uh, a volunteer or a pastoral staff um, in the safe sanctuary by your asking the parent to stay within earshot of what you're doing in a virtual um, listening, holy listening moment. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to need you, Emma, to click on the, so there's no volume with this. And you'll notice there I am and I'm greeting that sweet little, she is a fourth grader. And so the reason I chose a fourth grader is you saw a four-year-old do it and this one you're seeing a fourth grader. So I'm showing her, see on the little screen below, you'll see I am not putting very much time with my face. It goes on the stones and it goes, the camera goes onto the candle. So I'm asking her, oh, here's our holy listening stones and our candle. And I have that all set up ahead of time. Don't set it up with them on the phone, have it all laid out. And then I said, what do we need to do? And then she tells me that we need to light the candle. And I asked her, why do we light the candle when we're doing holy listening? And she said, because the Holy Spirit is with us in this conversation. And I said, you are so right. 
Thank you. So then we light the candle. And then do you notice I still do not have the camera on my face? It's still on the stones. This sets the child at ease and gives them continuous time to study. Now, the stones. I took the camera down and I'm showing them and look at her face. Look at her study. The reason there's no volume so you can look at her expressions in a few minutes here. Look at her eyes got big. As she makes some of the choices, you will see her look up and to her left. That's the memory. She's having a really good memory and it's why she chooses one of the stones. Now I can't see, hold on. There we go, I gotta move my, okay. So here she's getting ready to make her choices. And then I point to them and I'm like this one and then she shakes her head, yes, that one. And there she's thinking again, and she picks another. Okay, still the camera's not on me. It's all about her. And so she picks. So what she ends up picking, so do you see? Then I push away everything that we're not using and I focus the camera on the three stones. And she picks the, the swirl, and the sunshine and the exclamation point. So the first one, look at, you see her looking up? She's explaining to me why she picked the sunshine because her mom and dad bought them a trampoline last week during the <laughs> to keep them busy. And they've had so much fun on the trampoline. So then we go to the swirl one and she says, the swirl is because we're in a pandemic and everything is swirling around and it's just a lot is what she's telling me. And that's what she picked. And the last one is the exclamation point. And she said she chose that because she just feels excited and anxious and she doesn't know what's coming next. Now, the entire time that I'm doing, having this conversation, her mom is holding the camera for her and her mom is listening to this. Her mom later texts me and then phone calls me and said, I have never heard Sydney talk to anybody like she was just talking in such a comfortable, relaxed manner. She's always such an anxious child is what her mom said. And I didn't even know you all did this at the end of each class. So as we um, go on, she finishes talking. And then the most important, my most favorite part is I was said, Sid, would you like to pray? And then she, and when we're in her in class, she'll usually say yes. But this time she said no, but you always want to offer them the chance to pray and to pray and praying for them to release and relax and give it up to God. So Emma, you can stop the video here. And then Leanne. All right, great. All right, so you see how simple this is? What we're asking you to do is just trust a process. And until you do it, you think, wow, I mean, is this going to work? It works. Um, children are like pop cans who have just been shaken. And what Holy Listening does is it lets a little bit of their feelings out at each time that you meet with them. And it is amazing. We can survive this if we just don't shut down. It's that keeping those emotions um, moving, keeping those emotions coming out and out and out. So I'm just going to review really quick. So there's the beginning time, you greet the person, um, you ask them, you know, if they want to look at the rocks, whatever. And um, we also have done a little variation on it where we say, go into your house and find something that reminds you of how you're feeling. So they might get a sad teddy bear or they might get something and bring to you. And so that's really been great. That's been like an addition to the rock since we've got them at home anyway. And it helps them to focus a little bit better. So, um, so that's the beginning. And then the next slide is simply the... Next slide is um, you give them the stones to pick and you just listen. And what I want to stress is that this is not a time to fix anything. It is an acknowledgement that their feelings are real. It's holding sacred space and it's allowing God to do God's work. And um, lots of people will say, I don't know why we need holy listening. If my kid gets really bad, we'll get a therapist. Well, first of all, most children who need 
care won't get a therapist. They're expensive. They're on high demand. There won't be enough of them going around just for the people who are the most affected by this COVID-19. There aren't, it, when COVID-19 isn't happening, there aren't enough child psychiatrists. But this is the church's work. Like beyond whether somebody else could do this, this is our work. We are the ones who believe that we have a God who when we hold sacred space will come and heal children and heal all of us. And so um, I don't know why we would farm that out. This is our job, to sit and hold sacred space together with the kids. And that's all you're doing during Holy Listening. Then in the next slide, um, it simply is a closing and you say, you know, thank you and thank you for, for doing this with me. You blow out the candle, you put the rocks away, and then you do the most important thing of all, and that is um, the blessing. I think there's a slide on the blessing. No, there isn't. But anyway, here's, um, this is the blessing in your closing. If you do nothing else except warmly greet a kid, let them choose a stone, and then bless them. The blessing is important. What you say during the blessing to a child is, thank you. You have shared your feelings with me, and I appreciate it, and God has heard your feelings. You don't promise them anything. You don't say, I'm sure God will do this or God will do that. You simply say, I could feel God in this presence, and I hope you can, and in this time together, thank you. And then, um, and then you give it back to God. This is hard work. It's hard work because all of us went into ministry because we care deeply about people and their emotions. And so as they share, you can't help but take that on yourself. And so the blessing not only tells the child, your feelings matter, God has heard your feelings, thank you for sharing your feelings with me. Uh, it also gives you a chance to give that back to God. If you carry those feelings, you know, it's one thing if it's one kid or two kids, but by the time you've talked to five or six kids, plus their parents and had a day, plus your own stuff that's going on, it's just too much. So use that blessing to say, God, I am taking this child and their worries and I'm placing them where they belong, which is not in my heart. It is in your heart. You made this child. You created this child. You love this child. I'm trusting you with every bit of this child's situation. Give that to God, and then you'll be refreshed to go back out and do your work. Do you have anything to say about that, Melinda? Anything else? Um, yeah, just uh, another important thing, and as many of you are pastors or do any kind of pastoral care, know that it isn't especially during this time. You have the um, first two things. You need to not think that as the pastor, the children's minister, and the youth, it's the three of you, your staff job to do this. This training is going to be recorded, and we want you to, anybody that you feel their spiritual gift is to be a, a holy listener, you show them that video and you say, I, I need help. Because the possibility it is that this is going to be bigger than an average church week. A pastor might have to do three, three funerals in a week, and that was a hard, busy week. Or maybe some of you have stories to tell that you had five. And that was an emotional, hard week. But you may have five com heavy conversations in one day. You may have um, the inability to um, have a funeral and you're gonna have all of that family, all of those um, people needing somewhere to, to release. So have as many people in your church trained in this um, so that you're not carrying the weight of your entire congregation or your parish um, because this is going to be bigger than what we normally see in a normal uh, week in ministry. And the second is somebody needs to to be a, whole, a holy listener for the holy listeners. So Leanne tends to be the holy listener for the, for the holy, for her, her time for children people. They call and like tell her, but nominate somebody within your staff or your parish, or if the senior pastor wants to be the holy listener for the holy listeners, that also is a, is a good thing too. So decide who's going to be the listener for the for the holy listener, because if um, blowing out the candle is good when it's grief about, not that it's simple grief, but that what you just saw Sid share with me was not anything that I would carry heavy. Now, had she lost or a child had died or it was a, a, a big grief, I'm gonna need to let that go as well. So writing it down and blowing out a candle may not 
let that grief off of, of the holy listener. So pick someone who's the holy listener for your holy listening team is the other thing I would add. So now we're on the next slide. And this is a video modeling of holy listening for a teenager. This happens to be my son. He is 17 years old. Um, he has done this since he was very little. So he knew exactly what we were doing. So I didn't have to do a lot of uh, prompting or talking with him about it. But because he knew enough about it, he said, I'm not doing my own stuff. I'm not saying my own sayings. And because he, it's very personal, it's very intimate, and it's very personal um, saying, it's sharing. So I took uh, Leanne's example that she had shared that um, a student had done with her. And I said, okay, we'll do Leanne's example. And so you're going to watch him. Um, and this is another angle that we did there. So you could kind of see I'm in my house, he's in another space in the house, and um, I have him on FaceTime here. I have the holy listening all set up. You're gonna hear a common response that you're, you might get um, from a child, a teen, and maybe an adult, where I said, how are you doing? Fine. Do you wanna talk about it? No. And I give them choices. And so choices, I believe, is key. Another key point that why these holy listening stones work so well is because everybody likes a choice. Nobody likes to be made to do something. And so when you're asking someone point on, tell me how you feel. They have no other, they, that's, that's their only, that's their only, <laughs> you're just, you're putting them on the spot. Where when we give choices, we're going to get more from someone and get to a deeper level. So if you could click on that, Emma. Oh, and there's a little feedback, but I left it in there so that you could okay. see. Um, it's good to have earphones sometimes when you do this. Hey, Brave. I just wanted to reach out to you. Um, your mom had messaged me and said that you weren't feeling super good. So I wanted to do a little FaceTime with you and chat. What's going on? Really, your voice doesn't sound fine, and it's definitely been a lot going on lately. Is there a, hey, do you want to do holy listening stones? Remember, we've done that before. Would that help? No. Okay, well, do you want to go around your house and find something that might describe what you're feeling? Like, look through your stuff and find something? No, I don't want to get up. Don't do the challenge. Okay. All right. So let me um, flip, them around, flip this around. And I know it's been a while since you've done this, but before we get going, we always light a candle. Remember? And do you remember why we light a candle? No. To remind us that God is present, that God's Holy Spirit is present. So we've got a candle lit. And then I'm going to um, shine over or put the camera over the stone pictures and you just take them, take your time and look at all the symbols. And remember the symbols can be anything you want them to be. So I want you to look all over them and see if any of those symbols would describe or um, Give a picture clue to what you're feeling. So now that you've looked at all, can you pick three of them that might be an image that represents how you're feeling? Okay. okay, question mark? Okay. Why did you pick the foot? I picked the foot because 
Great. So did you see how she got a little pushback at the beginning of that? That's not uncommon. And sometimes you just have to push a tiny bit. I've had kids before who don't want to do it. And I just let, I just say, call me later then, you know, I don't push, but if you, if you can just get them to choose one stone, you can see the magic of them. Once they start doing it, once they engage, they're going to do it. So we've seen a four-year-old, a fourth grader and a teenager doing these. I am telling you, they work for all ages and this is simple. You can do this. So, um, so basically the steps are, get a candle, connect with a kid, hold that sacred space for God, and use the stones because the stones will help them put their feelings into words and then bless them and let go. If you do that with the kids in your lives, you're gonna help them um, tremendously in the weeks and the days to come. So that's kind of the end of our presentation, but I know I've been seeing the chat thing going off. So um, what questions have there been? What can we help you with um, as far as questions? Um, so one question that just came up was that um, the examples y'all used were um, 
we're with kids that are and youth that have already are already comfortable with the stones and so how would you introduce them at this point to groups um, or your children or youth who are not familiar with uh, this method right well the first one if you remember was griffin he'd never seen them before and that's why we included that one was because Basically, what you do is you say, listen, I know you're upset, or your mom told me you were, or this is upsetting times, whatever. I'm going to lay these stones out, and they're going to help you put your feelings into words. Um, I don't do a lot of like, do you want to talk to me? How do you feel about talking to me? Because the go-to answer for children is, no, I'm fine. And um, little ones will maybe want to, but some of them won't. Um, I, had, I talked to a child during this a crisis actually and he loves me like we are deep friends like this kid he does all my tech work for me you know he's in sixth grade he does all my technical work and all that and I called him his mom asked me to call him he asked me to talk and when we got on the phone I wasn't going to use the stones because I didn't think we needed them and he's just like la da 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 um, and I said how do you feel oh yeah I'm okay uh, finally I got out the stones because he could not get to that deep place of what he was feeling so I think that you have to trust the stones and you have to say I've got a tool that will help you talk. Do you want to try it or not? And you kind of show them because once they see them, they're kind of like, ooh, they, they go for them. In my office, where I used to have my spirituality center, I would have a plate of cookies and a plate of holy listening stones. And kids would come in who had never met me before and they would say, what are those? And they would be pointing at the stones, not the cookies. So there's something about the symbols all being together. They're just cool looking and they're kind of magnets for kids. So you would start just like, we started these calls, you would say, um, I've heard you're upset. Um, your mom asked me to talk to you. You've asked me to talk to you. Let's use this tool. It'll help you get started. And they want the help. Um, it helps them to start. Nobody likes that awkward phase of, I don't know what to say. I don't know if I'll cry. I don't know who this person is. Just get right to it and use those stones. Yeah. Another approach, um, if you did a Zoom or um, so, in a church setting, sometimes we'll do two or three kids together in a little small group. So if it is someone who you know that um, is just really closed down and just not going to be able to just jump in and start sharing as, as in most cases happens, you could get um, to, like I would get Sid and a couple, uh, another student, and then the one who I had some concerns, and maybe the three of us, or the three students and I would Zoom together, and you could do this in exact same thing. It's just, when it's with Zoom, it's a little, unless you have Zoom on your phone, it's a little harder to, to show those, um, the stones, but, um, and then you're letting the other kids who've done it before model for them um, and kind of break that talking, like break that, oh, that's what they did. And so uh, sometimes if I ever have a new kid in a group, once they see the other kids share and grab, then they'll do it by the end of that discussion. But again, it's not, you don't need a lot of prep. And again, um, Leanne said, if they're not into the, the symbols on the stone, go find something in your house that is visibly shows me how you're feeling right now. They might, who knows what they're going to grab, a blank sheet of paper, a stuffed animal, a, a plant, a, it doesn't matter, but they just need to explain why they grabbed that for you. So you, they don't have to be experts in this, but great question. Thank you. I would say that's the number one question I get is like, what do I say to start? And you say, here are some rocks. They will show me how you feel, use them. Really, the less you can talk about it, it kind of gets scary if you're like, it's going to tell me your deepest feelings. It's going to get deep. You're going to really cry. Well, you know, yeah. nobody wants to talk. So just get the stones out, show them. And I would say in 99% of the cases, they don't need help. They'll start talking to you the minute they see the symbols because that's their language, symbolic language. And you're just asking the question, why? Why did you pick that? Why? Yeah. And I think one of my favorite examples that Leanne ever said was that the one that kind of like, you might look at it first time and say, that's a tree. Uh, somebody might say, oh, I picked a tree for growth where she's had another student pick that and they didn't say tree. They said it, they flipped it upside down and they said, it's a bomb. My life is exploding. You, they're going to look at each of those symbols where <laughs> so you might go, that's a tree, but nope. Somebody else is looking at it from a different perspective and they're saying, no, that's, that's an explosion. So. 
Um, it looks like, I mean, there's another question about the ages that you use holy listening stones with, but I think y'all pretty much covered that. <laughs> um, anyone can use holy listening stones. Um, Kim Meyer said that she's used them with senior citizens even. Yes. It's been great. Um, and so I think if y'all don't mind, um, Ashley Ann Sype, who's at Fellowship and Trophy Club, just recently used them for the first time with her youth group over Skype. So if she wanted to quickly, I'm aware of our time, so I don't want to keep y'all too long, but uh, if, if she wanted to quickly share, if you don't mind, Ashley Ann, um, how that went with your youth group who's never used them before. They weren't using them as kids or anything um, so that we can have a sort of a firsthand account of a group of teenagers. Oh, I love this. Yeah, so sure. I don't mind sharing really quick. Uh, we have never used them before. My students have never seen them before. Um, but you shared, Emma, the sheet with all the symbols on one of our youth pages. So I grabbed that. I ended up adding numbers to the sheet so that the kids could reference right away which one they were looking at. Mm -hmm. And we used it for the first time oh, two weeks ago. And about half of them shared, and I didn't make it awkward. I just said, you can share if you want to. About half of them used it, and then I used it again this week to see what would happen again. And I could only honestly see on their faces when I said we were going to start that time, sort of a good, like I get to share. And they, every single one of them shared this week. And we're talking like high schoolers. So I, I love that you use the teenage son because it worked so well. And, and I think they liked making meaning out of the symbols. Mm -hmm. So they shared some really real stuff that I don't think I ever would have gotten out of them. Um, and I just explained, I was, sh I was sharing over in the chat with somebody who was asking, how do you introduce this? I just said, hey, I know it's awkward for us to have these conversations on Zoom. It's hard to kind of get in into conversation. So I just want to try this new thing. And so I kind of, I, sh I shared the screen. You can do uh, like y'all are doing a uh, screen share in here. I shared the screen with the symbols on it and they, it went right away and it's been awesome. So we're going to use it weekly. I'm excited. Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, all right. I don't see any more questions. Y'all did a great job. So you <laughs> definitely covered it. Um, we will post this, like I said, on our youth and children's page. Um, so that's just North Texas Conference. Um, let me pull up the official name. North Texas Conference Youth. Um, and then there's one for children's ministry as well. And then we'll post it on our website, ntcumc.org, under the COVID-19 responses. Um, and I'll post it, we'll post it with some other resources, the, um, the sheet of the stones and the how-to for holy listening. Um, and the, I think someone requested the chat thread. So we'll see if we can download that and post that as well. Um, and then um, I am always here. If you have any questions about a time for children or about holy listening, um, you can email me, emma at ntcumc.org. Um, happy to help with that um, in any way possible. And we have just really great children's and youth ministers across the North Texas Conference that are doing really important, purposeful, um, deep work with children's spirituality. Um, I'm really blessed to be in ministry with all of you. And so we have great, uh, a great community here to support each other. Um, so thank you, Leanne and Melinda for sharing with us. Well, Leanne, can you send us with a blessing, Leanne? Yeah. It wouldn't be a sacred I, moment if you didn't send us with a blessing. I was just gonna say, I just wanna thank you all for being here. I know that um, many of us in our jobs, we see ourselves kind of as you know programmers and we're not. We're pastors first, and that's why you went into this work. And uh, this crisis does give us an opportunity um, to test that, to know that, to be authentic in our jobs. And so I just thank you so much for being willing to do this pastoral care piece. It is critical. It is critical for our kids and for our teens. And again, I've worked with so many of you in this tech, in this conference. I know how serious you are about the jobs that you do and you um, are touching lots of lives. So may God bless you and keep you and may God give you the energy that you need um, and the emotional strength that you need to make it through these next few weeks. You've got a lot to carry and a lot of little people looking up to you and you are ready and uh, you're gonna do a beautiful job. And remember, all you got to do is hold that sacred space. God will do most of the work, um, but your faithfulness allows that to happen. So go with God's blessing and be a blessing. Thank you so much for having us today. And um, thanks to, the, to Emma and your staff for making this happen. You're the best. Thanks.